We want to welcome all of His Glory Nation as we continue our series in the book of Luke. Tonight we'll be in Luke 19. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher and the living Word of God, which is our Savior Christ the Lord. Okay, let's pick up uh, Dr. Luke in chapter 19. Here we go, 19.1. Then Jesus entered in and passed through Jericho. So Jesus is heading back to uh, Jerusalem. He's coming through Jericho. And remember, Jericho is a mighty city. That's where um, the battle of Jericho was fought. And the first Yeshua, uh, Yeshua Joshua. Remember, we, in our teaching in the book of Joshua, in Hebrew, Yeshua can mean Jesus and Yeshua can mean Joshua. And the book of Joshua is actually a typeset of the book of Revelation. And Joshua is a typeset of the Christ. So there's a lot of um, a lot of symbols and a lot of uh, things that happen in the book of Joshua that that Christ is going to actually fulfill. And uh, one is uh, the Battle of Jericho. And uh, you know we know Joshua through the the, the uh, arm of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, which indeed was Jesus Christ that came in and actually fought the battle and won the Battle of Jericho. And that is exactly where. Uh, uh, Joshua was told to put to put the the markers of the twelve tribes of stones in the area of Jericho for a memorial, and that is in the same spot where John the Baptist was baptizing and baptized our King of uh, our King of Kings and Lord of Hosts Jesus. So he's passing through Jericho. Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. So Zacchaeus was not only a tax collector, but he was a chief of them. So he was, a, he was a, a supervisor of the IRS, so to speak. Again, remember when we mentioned before, tax collectors in Jewish uh, heritage were just the worst of the worst because uh, people, one, they don't want to pay their taxes, but these were Jewish people working for the, for the Roman government, and they felt that they were uh, traitors, and they felt that they were trying to rob them because it was based on, their commission structure was based on whatever the tax of Rome required, uh, they would uh, wheel and deal with these people uh, above that so that they could pocket it. So they were uh, considered an unethical trade and also um, the traitors. So they were not looked upon at all. So when Jesus does this with Zacchaeus, it is, it is a very, very important thing showing that Jesus came for the people who have fallen short of the glory, not for, the right, for those who think they're righteous. Again, key words, think they're righteous and act righteous. We're all fallen and we need to humble ourselves in the name of the Most High God through Jesus Christ so that we can have forgiveness of sins. And we're going to see how Zacchaeus does this. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd. He was of short stature. So we know there's a, the, there's a uh, child's song in Bible study that little, little Zacchaeus uh, was a mighty man, grew up a tree, something like that. I'm terrible at singing, but um, he was so small in stature, very, very short. Um, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. So Zacchaeus was going to do everything he could to get above the crowd so that he could see the, the Christ. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So it was pre-planned. God, through Jesus Christ, knew that Zacchaeus was part of his, uh, his, uh, his perfect will and that he had to stay at his house, which was going to create a lot of uh, uh, turmoil with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be the guest with a man who is a sinner. So again, saying, oh, look at this sinner, Zacchaeus, and it, not even knowing the person's in, inward. They're just lumping, lumping him in as a sinner because they thought they were so more spiritually uh, prideful than anybody else. Again, God... It wants us to be humble. That means spiritual too. I mean, just because you know a little bit about the Bible or know a lot about the Bible, um, it, it is not up for you to um, uh, to boast about that. It's what we have learned is from the Most High God through the Holy Spirit, and we shouldn't boast in our spiritual knowledge. It's about our heart. It's about giving up self, knowing that we are fallen short of the glory of God and everything we do is for his namesake. We're going to see this in the parable here in a minute. So then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, I have given half my goods to the poor. And, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I will restore fourfold. So they misjudged him. Here's a man 
who was doing the right thing. He was just, and they didn't, and they they they, they wrongly accused him. He was giving uh, more than what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. They were tithing their ten percent. He was giving double to the poor, helping those people. And he says, "If I have wronged anybody, Lord, in your sight, show me my 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 sin, and I will pay that person back." fourfold because he is coming to pour it all open to the God of the universe through the Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to, to him, today salvation has come to this house because he is also the son of Abraham. He said, today salvation came to this house. Why did salvation come to the house? Because Zacchaeus believed that he was the son of God. He believed that he was the one that could wash away the sins. And salvation only comes through faith. And salvation comes through, uh, righteousness only comes through faith. And Zacchaeus poured out his heart and said, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I will be obedient to you and I will follow your ways. And he says, you are son of Abraham, literally in the line of Abraham. But even if you are not Jewish, um, you can be uh, grafted in to father Abraham. Um, through, through, uh, through, through, through trusting and accepting Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Paul talks about that in depth, that we as Gentiles are grafted into the, to Father Abraham because of our faith of Jesus Christ. So we are all uh, children of Father Abraham in that sense. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what, what is lost. He's looking for the lost souls, and that's what he's coming back, and he is coming to find the sinners those who, are, who, who have not had eternal life or not going to get eternal life. He's looking for them, letting them have the opportunity to repent and walk the way of the living Christ. Now, as he heard these things, he spoke another parable. Okay, this parable is going to be very interesting because he was near Jerusalem because he thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Okay, so they were looking for the kingdom of God to appear immediately. Where is the kingdom of God? We saw in the other Gospels that Jesus says the kingdom of God is like this little child. So the kingdom of God is literally in us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are the kingdom of God. There is the kingdom of God in the third heaven as we, as we speak today. There will be the kingdom of God in the millennial reign, which this is going to refer to here in a moment. When Jesus comes down, that will be the kingdom of God in the millennial reign. And based on what we've done in our will, or with our talents, as this parable will say, that what our positions will be in the millennial reign, life is a test preparing us for for eternal life and the millennial reign, what roles we'll have, and in this case, what cities that we will be responsible for. One of the reasons for the harpazo, one for the, for the elect that were, that were uh, diligently seeking the return, return of the Lord and never deny his name, but it was also getting them ready for the millennial reign and their roles. And then the kingdom of God will be eternity after the white throne judgment. We will all live in the kingdom of God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with no more time and eternity, no sun no moon, no sea, just in his agape love, praise his name. Okay, so he's going to talk about preparing for the millennial reign of the kingdom of God now. So he called 10 of his servants and described to them 10, uh, ten men, minyas. Uh, uh, a minya was about three months, worth of, three months worth of wages. So 10 of them is uh, 30 months worth of wages. So that's a, this, is a, this is a significant amount of money that he has left him to uh, in, invest. Um, so it, he, therefore he said, certain nobleman went to, into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minions and said to them, do business till I come. 10 is always the number of commandments and judgments. So we see the Ten Commandments. We see that um, in the Torah that if you were an illegitimate child, it was ten generations until you can inherit uh, the, the kingship of, of, of a house or um, uh, the, the kinsman redeemer of certain other things of property in the, in the law. So ten is always a number of judgment uh, or, or, or precepts or commandments. So this is what he, here's the judgment and the precept and the commandment that this is they're giving for what we do on the earth to prepare for the millennial reign. This is the spirit of what the Lord is telling us this parable about. So it was when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man uh, had, had uh, gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your menya has earned you ten menyas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, 
have authority over 10 cities. So the first one passed the test. The Lord gave him the talent of 10. He did what the will of the Lord was in his sanctification period. And he was awarded 10 cities in the millennial reign. That's what it is. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that's salvation. That's out of faith. There's nothing we can do to earn ourselves uh, to that. But once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it starts our sanctification walk. It's our purpose. It's our trial. It's our wilderness where God gives us his will for our will to meet his will to create a perfect will. So it is what we do for the Lord that matters. That's all that matters. And by being obedient and diligent and doing the will of the Lord here on earth during these trials and tribulations, instead of just being a Cheeto-eaten Christian on a couch, we are actually walking with the Lord in His glory, doing His purpose, what He wants from us. And we see in Romans that if we seek God's face, He will tell us what His will is. He is faithful and true. If we seek His face, we will know the will of the Lord. And what we do with that will be our reward on the Bema seat. And part of that will be five crowns of the Bema seat. And also that reward system will be what your position will be in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. When the thousand year reign will reign with Christ as kings and priests in the book of Revelation. So this particular uh, servant earned 10. So he is in charge of 10 cities. That will be similar to what we will do with, with, the, with the sanctification of our walk with, with, with God. Once you're saved by Jesus Christ, that blood, nothing you can do about that. It's a free gift. But once you start that walk, it's all about what you do for God's will in your life. It's a test. Do we fulfill his will? Do we do everything he asks us to do? And we do it with a loving, obedient heart. And then that will be where our position will be in the millennial reign. This is what he's talking about. And the second came saying, Master, your many has earned five minions. Likewise, he said to him, you also will have over, you'll be over five cities. Five is the number of grace. And it's only by grace that we get salvation. But sanctification is based on the works that we do for God out of love. Again, they're all love. There's five crowns. And once you get the five crowns, five is grace. That will also show you where your millennial uh, responsibilities will be. Going back to the Church of Philadelphia, remember, just look at the, the, the Church of Philadelphia and emulate that in itself. They missed the rapture because of their faith and truth and staying by the will, anxious awaiting the return. They never denied him, never denied his word. If you never deny him and you never deny his word, it means you're in his word. You know his word. You're diligently seeking him. And if you're diligently seeking him, you know his will for your life and you're obedient and you're fulfilling that. And you will be, as it says in the book or, or in the church of Philadelphia, you will be a pillar in his Jerusalem. That means you'll be in the inner circle. You'll be used mightily in the millennial reign for Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. That's why he's given us this parable. Uh, then another came, Master, uh, here is your minya, which I have kept and put in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you are a, st a steward, man. You, you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a, a steward, man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. So here he is not being obedient and also doing a false judgment, just like the world was. Um, and, and one part that we missed in this, uh, in this parable, it says that the world would come against this, this, uh, this, this kingdom owner. And that is a, a sign of Jesus Christ. The world is against Christ. It's only his elect that are standing strong in his name. You want to create chaos in the world today? You stand up and say, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And you'll have every, you'll, you'll have every religion coming after you. That is the one name that can spark riots immediately. Why? Because Satan knows. Satan knows that's the only way. It's the way, the truth, and the life. And many will deny his name in this world. Many will deny his purpose in their life. They may skate in by the skin of their teeth into the millennial reign, but they won't have the rewards and they won't be in a position that they'll be reigning with the Most High God. And that's what it's all about. We are the least. We are the least in the earth. As Jesus said, we are the meek, but we have trust in him and we are working to our heavenly realm and we're working for the millennial purpose because we love the Lord with all our heart our soul and mind and we're going to be due diligent and finish the race but he said to the master he has 10 menus for I say to you um, so he said uh, those who stood by take the menu from him and give it to the one who has 10 so the one that didn't do it he gave it to the one that, that was uh, that had the most give him more responsibility to more is given G God 
Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they test us with money. Money is usually the, the, the testing. The more we, we, we sow in love, the more we reap. The more we sow in uh, helping the kingdom glory, the more we'll reap. It's all about reaping and sowing for the word of the Lord and the love of the Lord. And that's what God wants us to do. Take the gifts, whether they're financial, whether they're talents, whatever they are for the will, and spread the kingdom glory. Because our treasures are not here. Our treasures are stored up in heaven, and our treasures will be in the millennial reign. Being, reigning, and, 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 and living intimately with Jesus Christ next to him in the new Jerusalem, as it says in Revelation 3 in the church of Philadelphia, that you, I'll make you a pillar in my mighty city, Jerusalem. Praise his holy name. For I say to you, everyone who will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So it's, it, it, it's all about taking what God has given us and, and using it for his purpose and his glory, not to keep it and store it up. Remember one of the, remember one of the um, uh, things in the law that lo, the, the Lord told us in the Torah? He said, do not store up silver and gold for self. God gives us financial uh, money to be able to spread that kingdom glory. And if we're not going to do it for his purpose, he's going to take it away or there's going to be judgment. And we don't want to get to the end of the world and say, look what all God gave to me, and I didn't do anything with it. I stored it up in my barn. I stored it up for a rainy day. No, God wants us to trust him and use that for his purpose and use that for his glory. But bring those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. So those enemies that did not want him to reign, these are the ones that I said earlier in this parable that were against Christ. They will have justice of the sword. They don't want Christ to reign over them because of a hardened heart, deception from, the, uh, from Satan. Whatever, whatever worldly things that took him away from the true God through the blood of the, his son, Jesus Christ, it will have judgment everlasting upon them. And that will be entering into the millennial reign. And then the, after the thousand years, the white throne judgment. And then the books are open. Names removed. And then those who denied the Christ will acknowledge that they missed it. And they will be put in the lake of fire. When he said this, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem. And he came to a pass when he drove near Beth, Bethphage and Bethany, the mountain called Olivet. And that he said to two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you'll find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. So Jesus is preparing for the triumphal entry. This was prophesied in Zechariah 9 9, that he would come in on a donkey colt. And uh, we're, we'll see that uh, in uh, verse 36, um, that is showing 2 King 9 3, uh, 9 13 where that was the, the, what they would do to anoint a new king. So this is Jesus coming in for the first time in his ministry to declare, I am the king of kings. And they denied his name. And they're going to see the judgment that came on the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD that he prophesies right here. But he is fulfilling Bible prophecy with Zechariah 9.9. 9. There's also Daniel 9, which is an incredible, incredible, incredible prophecy. Comes up to the exact day on Palm Sunday, that Sunday before Christ's uh, triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem, declaring that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of hosts. And they denied it. And Daniel 9, it was Sir Robert Anderson in the early 1900s that discovered this uh, Daniel 9 prophecy that was actually to the day that the Messiah would announce that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Hosts, and they would deny him. Sir Robert Anderson was actually knight, knight, knighted for this, this, this discovery. Okay, verse 32, and those who were sent away or found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And he said, the Lord has need of it. And then the Holy Spirit steps in and there's no more. Nothing's going to stop God from his purpose. No man, no weapon ever formed is going to stop what God has ordained. He is magnificent. He is omnipresent. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of all things. Praise his name. And as he went, um, then they brought him to Jesus and they went there and closed on the colt and then they set Jesus on him. So this is a symbolism as in 2 Kings of get, putting him on a donkey. Donkey was the, was the sign of a king coming in and that's why they're going to say Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lord on that Palm Sunday. That's why we as Christians in the Western Hemisphere uh, celebrate Palm Sunday. That's 
Jesus Christ triumphal entry, and they didn't get it. They, 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 they denied him. Um, so he spread the clothes on the road. Then as he went uh, now, now, drawing near to the scent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the mighty works they had seen. They're praising God for the mighty works that, that they had seen. And we're going to see in 1938 that this is uh, quoting Psalm 118.26 and praising God, saying, this is our King of Kings, and they missed it. Saying, blessed is the King who comes in the name of Jehovah. This is the King. This is the Messiah that the prophets have been talking about from the line of David. People in heaven and glory in the highest. People in heaven and glory in the highest. They're knowing that this triumphal entry is setting Bible prophecy and that they will deny him. But the second time he comes in with justice and his remnant, his elect will not deny his name, will not deny his word and stay steadfast for the love for him. No matter what the world brings at us, we're steadfast because our trust is not in the world not in government, not in any military, but our trust is in the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, our God, our Savior, through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, praise His name, His glory nation. And some of the Pharisees called to Him from the crowd and said, Teacher, rebuke your dis disciples. You're claiming He's a King. Rebuke them. And Jesus said, Nope, I can't do that. And He answered them and says, I tell you that if these should kept silent, then the stones would immediately cry out. And it was, I think it was uh, uh, Chuck Missler that comically said that he wishes he'd take a stone from Jerusalem and put it on his desk. And somebody comes into his office desk and, and say, what do you, what, what's that stone from? And he'll say, it's, well, it's from, it's, it's from Jerusalem, the stone. And it's one of those stones that didn't cry out as a, a comical thing. So what Jesus is saying, these people know that I'm the Messiah and they're crying out. If they were kept silent, the stones, the stones that are holding the dead people behind them, the, the, the death of the saints that understood Jehovah God and love of the Messiah would cry out and say, he is the King of Kings and the Lord of hosts. Abraham and David and Moses and Aaron and Elijah and Elisha and all of them, Jonah would all cry out, this is he that was spoken, spoken about. He is our King of Kings, Lord of hosts forever. And they didn't listen. He said, known each one, especially in your day, that the things that make for your peace. So, I'm sorry, verse 41. Now, as he drew near, um, he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. So he got close. And he st and this is one of the few times that Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Because they had a hardened heart and they denied, they denied the king. They denied Jesus Christ. They didn't have it with their heart. They tried to be intellectually, and then their pride got in, their, their spiritual pride, their intellectual pride, their, 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 their love for world, their love for material. Same as today. That's no different. We, we blame the Pharisees and the Sadducees for getting it wrong, but we're there today. There's more distractions today, more deceit today, more destruction today. Satan is, is going, he knows his time is, 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 is limited. He's frantic, and he's trying to bring every single person he possibly can down. Because one that is not in the glory of God for eternal life is one that Satan has taken from God. And it's a battle. It is a literal spiritual battle for souls. And we need to take this battle. It's more important than any military battle ever fought. Because the military battles are over flesh. Remember Jesus said, beware of the one that can take away your soul. Not the one that can take your flesh. Because the flesh will be rebuilt in a new body. But the soul and the spirit, if we have Jesus Christ, will live on forever, eternity. It's the soul and the spirit is the battle. It's a battle that's raging today. And we need to pick up our sword, which is the word of God, and put on the, all the elements of the, of the uh, protection in Ephesians 6.10. And the cease in praying, that is the, the, the carpet bombing. Pray without ceasing, as Paul says. If you know, so that's why Jesus wept. They didn't get it. And saying, verse 42, saying, if you known, even you, especially in, the, in, in this, your day, the things that make your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. They're blinded as, as, as Paul was blinded for a moment in time. As it says in Isaiah, they were blinded. They, their eyes were blinded. They had circumcision of the eyes. They needed to be scales and open their eyes because they were not using their heart to find God. God is always from Genesis 
till revelation is always wanting the heart. He says it to Jeremiah. He says it to Isaiah. I don't want their sacrifices. I don't want their traditions. I do not smell their burnt offerings. I want their heart. God wants a agape relationship with our heart. That's all he's ever wanted. And now we have the opportunity to do that through the Son, Jesus Christ, for eternity. If we accept him with our heart and voice it with our mouth, that he is our king, he's repenting us, uh, re we repent of all our sins, and we're going to be obedient to him. And, and um, so he, he said, For days will come upon you when your enemy will build an, an embankment around you, surround you, and close you on every side. So Jesus is talking about the prophecy of 70 AD when the Romans came in and did that, when, when it said that literally every stone will be, uh, will be turned over is what Jesus said. And literally that happened. They w the Romans went against what, the, what the, the Caesar said and what the generals had said. They didn't want to destroy the temple because there was, there was valuable instruments in the temple. There was gold. And they set it on fire. And when you get fire hot, what does gold do? It becomes liquid. And the liquid went between the rocks. And when it hardened, they were literally moving every rock to get to the gold for, their, for, for, for material, for riches. So literally his fulfillment became true, that every stone was unturned, was turned over because of that. And I level you and your children with you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't know the time of my coming. And this is what's going to happen, 70 AD. It was a horrible time. And history shows us that there was a delay between uh, a Caesar and one of the generals. And the only ones that escaped during 70 AD were, uh, according to historians, over a million Christians. They knew the time. They knew what Jesus said. And they got out of Dodge. And it was, it was the unfaithful that stayed behind. And they paid the price. Uh, then he went into the temple and he began to drive those who, who bought and sold. So he went into the temple and showed that the temple had become a place of commerce instead of a place of prayer. And Jesus was not going to tolerate that. We know in Isaiah, my house should be called a house of prayer. When you go in to worship the Lord in his temple or in your area um, that you go into your prayer closet, there's not to be any gold or silver or idols or anything in there. It's not about commerce. It's about a blood relationship. It's about a heart relationship. It's about a agape relationship between you and the Most High God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that love, that love that He has for you and the love you have for Him cannot be faked and is eternal. He has you in the palm of your, His hands and He will never let you go. That is our promise from Him. Praise His name all over His glory nation. And uh, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves. They were using the house for monetary purposes. They were selling. They're up, upping the price of currency exchange. They were selling animals for profit. They were doing everything for profit instead of doing it for the love of the Lord and calling on him in prayer. Verse 47, he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him. He was now a threat because of their, their, their financial situation, their, their position of authority, everything the world uh, they were looking for instead of the love and the true scripture. They should have known, and their hearts were hardened. Their eyes were, 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 were sealed across because they missed the Messiah. Messiah was right behind them, and not only did they deny him, they sought to kill him. And we look at that as a tragedy, but no, it was the greatest triumph because it was talked about in Genesis 3.15 that it would be the foot, the foot of the seed of the woman that would crush the serpent once and for all. And he won that battle on Calvary. He won that. as glorious. It was a victory. And that victory is forever for the Lord. Since he won that victory, now it all boils down to are you going to be on Team Jesus? And if you're going to be on Team Jesus, the only way, he is the way, the truth, of life, is to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins and be obedient to him and say, you are my Lord, and you'll have everlasting life, and you'll be with him for eternity. Eternity. He's come to give up his life, and he came to give up his life because he loved you so much. And God the Father loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son so that we could be reconciled to the Most High God because of love. Everything he does is love. And um, we close out in verse 48, and we're unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. The people still wanted to hear him because he had 
control, uh, or um, that's the wrong word I want to say. He had a way with a word that no one had ever, uh, ever be, no teacher could, could, could speak before. They had a lot of good teachers, like Galileo. He was a, a teacher of the law. Uh, Nicodemus was considered one of the chief rabbi, but nobody spoke the scripture like, the, like Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the author of the word. He is the word. He was with God. He was, the word was with God. The word was before the, the world, and he is the word. He comes back as the title, the living word. And it is the word, the sword, the two, dual-edged sword that we fight the enemy with. And that is getting in the word of God to fight the spiritual battle. And this battle is real. This battle against kingdom versus kingdom. It's Satan's kingdom against God's kingdom. And you've got to take your sword, the word of God, and you've got to fight this battle. You've got to put on the full armor of Ephesians 6.10. And I implore each and every one of you, before you go to bed each night, pray and read Ephesians 6.10 and put the whole armor of God on you and get in his word so that you can be the elect, so that you can be closer to him and you will know how much he loves you. We pray that uh, Luke 19 has been a blessing to you and may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you until Luke 20. God bless you.